when you're talking to your friends at UCAR, mention it. That, mention that my daughter in South Carolina at least once would like for you guys to make the Grand Canyon feature. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm Rich Jeffries, and I'm a senior advisor to the UCAR Community Programs. And let's get let's this. Get that so we spell it right. Yeah. I'm gonna make sure we yeah. credit for. So I'm Rich Jeffries. Yeah. Our yeah. community program. Yeah. Kind of viewer news. We're a citizen-based pollution privacy and propaganda right. news outlet. We just basically cover you know climate change on a local level. Okay. Things like water, you know, plastic in the ocean. I map it out for you. It's and we like to provide you know sensing for people to monitor the weather. Mm -hmm. And um, you guys, you guys are uh, pretty pretty big up high up there in the world of uh, doing weather studies. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about UCAR? I've heard a lot about you online. I'd like to hear it from you. Okay. Well, UCAR is a, it's a very interesting place to work. They're, um, they're doing a lot of very cutting edge research that's associated with many aspects of the geoscience, it's not just the meteorology and climate change. They're actually uh, doing space weather studies. They build <laughs> sensors. And, weather in the cockpit studies, they're working on all kinds of research initiatives that are associated with very, very high resolution modeling, how you use satellite imagery and make decisions on support, they're working on things that are associated with um, societal impacts of the climate, changing climate, you know, and the extremes, the increases in the extremes and all the little things that we're dealing with. In addition to that, we do a lot of things that are associated with outreach to K-12 group, and that's what a lot of this stuff is. This is all designed for, you know, teaching teachers, or helping teachers teach, you know, the different things associated with climate change and the weather and the various things going on. These are all little things that they can use as lab exercises in the classroom. Very cool. You know, all the little things that go along with, you know, running these types of programs. These are 3D simulations, so these are glasses that you can peel off and put your right eye on, the, on this and look at this and it becomes a 3D image. Very cool. You know, look at, look at me with that. Let me see. This there we are. This a 3D image so oh, yeah. that they can actually see the 3D. This is a hurricane. Yeah. And then this one is the solar flare event. Solar of, you know, for space weather and what causes, you know, all the things that happen with solar flares. Yeah. And, Coronal mass ejection. What is this right here? That's the sun. What is this? That's the corona. This is the mass. This is the flux. The mass ejection. Very cool. Very, very cool. Very cool. This is the card. This is about doing weather observations. So when STEM study programs is teaching the basics and fundamentals of weather, they use this, and then on this side, it has the weather identification table, and then on this side. It shows them how the sky viewer states the sky for coding things. So what they do is they cut this piece out, and then they look through the box. Right, right. And then the reference materials are on the side. Yeah, so, so right here, this is a great example. Ice haze, um, a guy from C-Res, he was a Chuck Long, he was talking about how planes are creating a sub-visual ice haze. It's geoengineering the planet. And he's referring to right about here, where the sky gets whiter on the horizon than it is up the top because there's denser aerosols. Right, and then this side is looking at the weather cloud series. So these are all the cloud genre. And this is all about how you pick up low, mid, and high clouds and what they look like and how you look through the you know, So you look at the viewer on this side. Mm -hmm. And these are all tools for the classroom for the STEM teachers. Here's a, you have a cloud viewer, and ours is called a climate viewer. Right. And, uh, I don't, I don't see apparatus on here, any sort of mamatis and some of the crazier... Well, we are getting into the crazier yeah, things. things. I mean, we, that's all rated on the yeah. cloud. Yeah, and it gets really crazy beyond that. Right. Yeah, it's, but it's then we stuff. also have online training tools that the Comet program has built over here that are associated with actually teaching them simulations of how they actually take weather observations. Yeah. So this is just a Comet booth that's over here. Right? <laughs> Okay. And our comment has about 800 hours worth of uh, online education training for sure. Okay, so we're going to uh, say I'm, I'm homeschooling my children. Yep. Do you guys provide material for homeschoolers? They do. The comment has the homeschoolers could actually go online and use the project. And then those, they have tests and three of those tests. Awesome. They can be used to, to work on the, well, we know they use them for the scout badges. They can also be used in the... Oh, boys. 
to foul, to foul with it. Now this concept is uh, we have an international, we work with the U.S. aid group under their Office of Federal Disaster Assistance to help build uh, societal resilience in emerging nations. And that's all about teaching them to build the capacity to monitor weather, climate. Not build the floodplains. No, we don't, we, don't, we don't get into that piece. We okay. teach them on how to, to monitor their processes because this is me speaking. I'm not an official voice, but me speaking, the front lines of climate change are islands spread around the equatorial belt. They're dealing now with what we're going to be dealing with, with coastal inundations and all that stuff. They deal with it every day. Because as the tide comes in, they're inches above sea level, not feet like we are in a lot of places. And so when that comes in, you know, their transportation systems get this you know, they're, they're having all kinds of issues that are associated with, uh, you know, how they're having to change their daily life processes, their commerce, you know, how they get from different places. So what about, like, uh, weather modification, you guys? We are not doing a lot of that. We work with people who work. Uh, you know, like the Saudis are doing some weather. UAE. Of, UAE, those kinds of things. And we, you know, NCAR does some assistance for those things, but they are actually state sponsored things in the world. What is the difference between NCAR and UCAR? Uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research is a federally funded research and development lab. And they, have, they were established a little over 50 years ago. Uh, it's coming up close to 60 years ago, and they were, when they were established, they had to have a management group to manage all of the accounting, finance, all of the various things that, that go on to run an organization like that to allow the researchers to do research. So it's like the corporate side of UCAR? UCAR, NCAR is the research center, UCAR is the corporate. Okay. And UCAR has been the corporate management for 50 years. They, uh, we're in a recompete process right now, but every 10 to 10 years or so, there's a recompete of the management contract, so it's corporate. And UCAR has bid on that again, and we're in the process of doing that. So, so NCAR would be associated with like the Wyoming Weather Modification Pilot Program and the Snowy thing. Yeah, Whereas and UCAR is managing that, and then UCAR has another about 50 million dollars worth of uh, research to operations transitions programs and integrations into the classrooms and international things that are not part of science foundation things like that UCAR runs those under the UCAR community partners and their job is to work more closely with the end users and the uh, citizens you know, to, to actually uh, help them adapt, interpret, understand, and use the different, yeah. you know, the different pieces of the puzzle that the basic research discovers. Yeah. And you have to figure out, you know, how do you apply that? Yeah. How does this become reality, technical, technology that can be useful? That's right, and that's what you Park Community Programs does for domestic and okay. And then who, who do you guys get your funding from? UCAR Community Programs is, is funded through um, government ag other government agencies besides Science Foundation. There are a few uh, commercial private partnerships that we do where you know we are uh, a research laboratory and a public nonprofit, and so we can't restrict any of our research or do any of our things to where it's not available to the public. But we can work with people to help them develop technologies for certain periods of time. And then eventually it becomes open source, collaborative, that kind of thing. And so we do small amounts of work with, with private sector people. And then we, do, uh, we work with NASA, and we work with NOAA, and we work with uh, Interior Department of Interior, and we work with uh, um, Reclamation. Reclamation. And it's all focused on different types of applications of what climate change is. I mean, we've got big programs that are working on things like the, the, the climate change impacts on uh, water resource management. And then we work on all the disciplines of water resource management.
train the engineers how to recognize the climate change things and then give them thoughts on how they can they mitigate. Um, since you guys do a lot of research on weather modification, what I was curious is, um, do you know if there is like a registry of clouds in the project? Other than the one that NOAA has that's required by the Weather Modification Reporting Act and so those reporting files, they go to NOAA. But what I've been trying to find, you know, just for you know, requiring minds to want to know, is like, is there a global registry of weather modification projects? Well, there is a, there, it's not complete by any means, but there is um, groups within the World Meteorological Organization that here are trying to keep track of who's doing what along those lines. So, how do you pronounce that guy's name? Rolf Jabrutes? The, the, he's the, the head of the, he works for you guys, I believe, and he's the head of the World Meteorological Organization's expert team on weather. So, those guys, they like, have... talking about Roloff. Rol Roloff. How do you spell? How do you pronounce it? Well, it's Roloff. 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 Jabrutes? Jabrutes, right. Roloff. <laughs> And I can't pronounce it very well. I don't want to like mispronounce it when I finally <laughs> right. But Roloff is a, that's how you pronounce his name. Okay. Roloff. Uh, Roloff is um, he's part of that group that's working on that expert team. Yeah. Now that is a self-reporting thing that comes from WMO members, and they're constantly trying to keep it up to date. And so I would not either disparage where it is or say that it's accurate, but yeah. there there is a group that's trying to keep track of that. Yeah. And if you find Roloff, he can probably tell you where you can find it at WMO. Yeah, and the last reports I saw from their site was in like 2008 when they ended. And it's kind of, you know, like, for, for the public, we're all want, you know, people want to know, are people still modifying the weather, how much and when and how Well, there's often. projects, I know there's a project in time. Philippines, 200 tons of uh, right. salt dumped out. Right, you know, and, and they're Mexico working. And the list goes on. Well, right, and there's some in the Middle East, and you know they're working on. I know it's still going on. I will tell you that, uh, and this is, uh, it, it's not, you know, but there's a change in the way that countries report things to the world. My guess is, is that it isn't gone. Stuff being reported to. And they did the same thing in America. There was some sunshine act setting on the reporting act. And they said that they were going to change the way the reporting went in America. And that's where my story ends. And I'm trying to figure out, well, are you now free to modify the weather without telling anybody? Is well, there's there reporting going on. I, I know that NOAA law is still in effect for America. But well, there's reporting going on. I just don't know for sure what the governing regulation is yeah. right now. But they are reporting because I was just in Thailand about in August teaching classes. And I was teaching weather interpret model interpretation to the people who actually were doing the work in Northern Thailand. I've heard that before. It's not an uncommon thing where they're out there, you know, hey, we're doing operational planning today and we really don't understand the synoptics of anything we're doing, so please come over here and explain to us about atmospheric rivers and how we're putting too many seeds in the sky for rain Well, falls. we were actually teaching them lots of things about uh, about how to actually initialize models and how to understand. Because you know, it was a lot of geoscience, it was a lot of geoscientists that weren't strictly meteorologists, and so we were teaching them, you know, the fundamentals of meteorology to understand what they were looking at. Well, on that, that model question, they had this thing called the GeoMIP. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. GeoMIP. Anyway, it's a the, the integrated assessment of geoengineering proposals, IEGP. And they have several of these geoengineering models of what the future climate will look like in a geoengineering scenario. And my concern is that <laughs> aerosol cloud interaction is the greatest unknown in climate science. It doesn't even really seem to be in any of these models. Um, you know, without somebody saying very poor next. Year. So we're in a situation where planes are making cirrus clouds on a daily basis, and everybody claims that we don't know how it's done. And you have people online who are literally threatening the scientists here for what they perceive as weather modification of an ill intent. And we're trying to go, look, these are serious clouds. But you go talk to the, the, the representatives from the FAA, they say crazy things like, we want to make clouds by day, done by night. 
<laughs> this is Dr. Rangasai Halthori, head of the Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative. He did the access flights. I'm pretty sure you know about those. Aviation crews and, you know, whatever, access. So now they're doing these new ones. They're going to start a new series of them. And they announced that the press could come talk about their biofuels for contrail control thing that's going on tomorrow. I'm here, I can't be there. But we're in a situation where the cirrus cloud issue is like a predominant geoengineering conundrum. A guy named Ken Calderi, you're probably familiar with him. No, he says cocktail geoengineering. If we can melt cirrus clouds away, we'll never need the U.S. Or. It's, in, it's in his most recent paper. The truth story of most, she pre presented here at the last conference. She said cirrus cloud seeding can melt. So they're putting out all these ideas to melt away clouds that planes are making on a daily basis. And, you know, I just watched the guy up there from NASA, he had the 2008 volcano. And there was that paper about the E3 AWACS making circles over the UK, and they said 5,000 times less radiated portion of CO2 from all planes since the start of aviation. So if these clouds have that much greater an effect on the climate than CO2, why are we not talking about that? I mean, as a weather modification aspect. I, I'm not sure. That's, oh. I mean, that's not my specialty. I'm, but I, you, you can understand where I'm coming I'm from. I understand the question. It's a visible weather modification that lay people are freaking out about on a daily basis. And I understand why they would be concerned. You start a day with a blue sky, you end with a gray sky. And almost every day where I live, in South Carolina, where my friends live in Virginia, any of these high traffic areas, you know, all the weather modifications in the world from cloud features, nobody will ever even notice that. This happens every day in the skies over your head. So. Well, yeah, and that's the aviation. That's but they, the aviation weather impact on the climate. Yeah. Yeah, but they, but, but maybe I'm wrong. You're not in his comfort zone. Yeah, I you know. know. I, don't, I don't want. I don't want to. I'm not. Be, you're right. This is not. You're my, right. You're totally right. It's not my comfort but, zone. But as far as his atmospheric modeling goes, I feel like there are some big gaping holes that are filled by some of this information. Maybe we could get a wrap our head around aviation's impact on climate as opposed to just dealing with death threats from public and mocking scientists. On the other hand. I, when I spoke to the head of the FAA, I said to him, instead of saying chemtrails are not a thing, why wouldn't you say, you know, here at the FAA, we're real concerned about chemtrails. We're actually trying to use biofuels to get rid of them. That would be much more honest. You know what he said to me? I think you're right. You can do a better job. So really, I know that they have a talk here on relaying climate information to the public and how they're failing at it. This is one of the main ones. And I hope that you could... Talk to your, your well, I can talk to the people yeah. in the NCAR about, about this, but <laughs> this one's not in my comfort zone about working on this piece because I'm not an expert. And, and William Cotton is supposed to give an excellent talk on this tomorrow. Oh, really? So, yeah, he's going to, apparently, I was told by some people that they, what he's going to say is going to really shock a lot of people. And he's going to talk specifically to the nanoparticles and cloud. So, anyway, I really appreciate the interview. I do appreciate what you guys are doing. I'd love to take some of this to my daughter. And, and well, we didn't get to talk about this too yeah, much. What, what is this? Okay, so one of the capacity development things we've been working on is building low-cost weather sensors to put in the emerging nations that they can maintain by themselves. Okay. And so what these are called is the 3D printed automated weather stations. And all these parts are printed using a 3D printer and it's all open source. And we can build all of these sensor components, each one of these is somewhere between 500 to 800. I almost made it. And we build all the little parts of these pieces. This is a strain gauge. That's one of our standard steps with a chipping rain gauge and all that. We've actually been printing the humidity and hygrisker stack for another one right here. And this has been printing here right wow. in front of it. Very cool. These are all the balanced uh, anemometers and uh, you know pieces and you know all different parts of pieces. Guns with a sensor, version three Raspberry Pi system. Yeah, and it creates all of the 
the uh, databasing, it's got a little onboard Linux system. How do you transmit the data? It's uh, done with Wi-Fi or you can hard it's connect it. Sorry, what kind of form is it? Oh, it's a net CDF. It's a net CDF and we have translations and so on and so forth. You can actually make it fit here for me to take it. It, it's transmitted out. There's the data going. This is live. Not sensor. Oh. So it's cracking. That point, this guy needs to be on the phone. She sent me a list of things that were going to be on the phone. By that time, it was, yeah. Okay, I thought you were going up. We're, we're trying to build a local Well, I'm going to see something. Right, it's nice. Yeah. 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 Low budget, this is exactly. And we're doing yeah. this right now. Sensor courses in your undergraduate programs to where they can actually build these in the classroom. And then awesome. deploy mesonets around to where they can actually learn how these all work as part of the science program. So this is part of what we're doing here. And then down at the end down there, we've started moving education and training into the virtual reality space with the weather stuff where you can actually move the person around to where they can actually go vertical actually look at the different parts of all of the processes and anything that can be modeled in that TV or can be displayed in the very model and you can actually then put the person in the three and four dimensional field, which changes completely the perspective of the TV flat map and we've done this on. Yeah. I'm using a CZ ATIs, CZ of the three flows, WebGL. And mine's called Climate Viewers. And what, we, what I've done so far is gather like everything from NASA gives, um, you know, NextRad, Wind Profiles, basically every open source um, sensor network I can find, I've thrown it on there. I'm getting ready to add that Gozar. Oh, that Gozar is beautiful. Um, what we want to do is try to make a low cost unit. This is what you're talking about. The people can put their bags out so that it does rain samples, all, all sky camera, that sort of thing. The way we've done it so far is we've got this package. It's about $5,000 that we take to a place where we build it. And it'll have a two 3D printers in it, all the stock it can take and parts it can take to build to it. And then it comes with a training package. It's all open source, it's a website. It can be downloaded. It, it, all of the, the printer so the software is open source. The, the graphics, you know, for the 3D print, it's all here. Every time he says open source, he makes my day. So all of this is available as part of what we're, we're doing as far as moving this forward. It's because, you know, for us to be able to, to, to be able to handle these large volumes of data that come in in these very, very high resolution numerical models that we're building, we need to actually build validation sets and all of being validated in WMO standards. And, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because the more, the more data, better accurate predictions. And I'm totally with that. And you say an open source, you to me. So I definitely want to look into this stuff. You can uh, rinse you car in car, very good company, masters of weather, open sourcing the weather stuff. That's pretty epic. Yeah. Pretty epic. Well, thanks for really stopping by talking to me. I grab something to do rain samples. And, and, uh, and we'll do that. specifically by constituents in the rain sample, like doing spectro spectrometry, you know, like a GCMS kind of deal, but on the quick. Something that can read out, <coughs> say, my rain samples have this in it. It's got this much of this chemical, this chemical, this chemical. There's a lot of people online really upset about a lot of things, and one of the best ways to tell what's coming out of the sky is to catch rain samples. So a lot of people get dirty rain samples because they don't understand they live downwind from a paint plant. But regardless, it's something that's useful and it's a data set that's almost non-existent. So what we were thinking is rain sample in the backyard tied to an all-sky camera, store video, which gives NASA Globes doing that thing with the you know digital citizen observer thing so that they can validate, uh, validate satellites from the underside. So why not put citizen-powered network, why don't we put an all-sky camera on all these things? 
So this is kind of where we're going with it. It's a citizen observational network, and it's your own local climate viewer. You put it in your backyard, and you can tell what's falling on your house or over top of it. Um, but as far as doing it cheaply, <laughs> I mean, you've got the little laser guns. You can point at stuff, and it'll tell you to read it out. Um, we thought about having like a drop box where it fills up for the day, does a sample, then empties itself. Um, I mean, what would you suggest for something like that? For rain sampling specifically. Rain sampling the whole bit. Uh, we, I, I mean, one possible option, uh, although uh, we were looking at doing using solenoids to, you know, as you say, kind of a little dump after, yeah. you know, which you could program to the Raspberry Pi to open it. It's just on a time day. delay, you yeah, know. Or, Once a day, yeah. dump it after doing this. Right, right. I mean, we've done also some big tipping buckets. Uh, but you can't, you can't, you know, they depend on how much rain you get, so they don't tip regularly. Yeah. They tip it sits on the, on the yeah, volume. Once collected. it hits a, a, a the volume, volume yeah. it tips, yeah, we've been working on that sort of thing. But so it's just daily figuring out the difference in what, okay, this is the daily rainfall I went up there. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so but, that's a, but we're not, we're not really looking for like rainfall totals. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's something that does not exist. I mean, it, it, in, a, in a grand scale, when we have the aerosol robotic network and things like that, that, but they're not really dealing with what's in the rain, they're dealing with what's in the air. So it's just a it's a you know common sense kind of question. Why don't we know more about what's coming down in the rain? So it's one of the things that you know I have a wish list of what I want to include in my little local climate viewer I want to build. And rain samples is one of them, all sky cameras another. The last one being electromagnetic radiation spectrum analysis. You know, Detection of EMPs, detection of localized electromagnetic problems. Um, some people call it electro smog, uh, but basically electrical field testing. You know what I mean? Um, we, we're now in the age of ionospheric heating and cloud ionizers and things like that. And there are a lot of people concerned about, hey, you know, the storm came through. I felt my head was cooking hot with electricity, and I heard reverb, you know, infrasound all day long, I saw rib bones in the sky, what the hell is going on here? So something as simple as an electromagnetic spectrum would either confirm or deny that they're crazy. So in the lack of data, crazy will occur. So this is one of the situations where I'm trying to diffuse upset crazy people on the internet with facts, but it's real hard for me to do that even as a layperson because there are no facts. So, I mean, maybe y'all can ponder that one as well. How can you pull off a good rain sample? Um, I think that it would benefit a lot of people. They're working on it. They're working on it. I mean, look at this stuff, man. This is impressive. The fact that you guys open sourced it, that you're not being greedy about it, that it, you got you obviously got your heart in the right place. Bravo. Seriously. I love what you're doing, and I'll definitely talk about it to everybody I know. Okay, so we want to quickly go through this. If this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from you all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. The bell doesn't always work, so come to ClimateViewer.com and sign up for our newsletter. Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people.